Turn the book of Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to be talking to you tonight about overcoming the yo-yo effect in your life. You say, well, I don't have any yo-yos. Well, stick around. You will be pretty soon. But uh, just like we just sang, it's a day-by-day process, isn't it? It isn't something that we look at and we try to live a year at a time. How many of you ladies would like to think about the meals you're going to cook for a whole year? You wouldn't want to think about that, would you? You'd probably give up. I mean, you throw in the towel and say, we're all going out to eat for every meal, all right? But it's a day by day, and I think this is, if you listen very carefully, I think this is where a lot of Christians get sidetracked. They try to live the Christian life one week or one month at a time, rather than living it at a one day, day, one, uh, one day at a time principle. And uh, if you think about that, it makes it so much easier. I mean, it's just like a day's work. Uh, you can't think about, well, well I've got to get, get all this done today. Well, if you look at it that way, then you become weary. You, you kind of almost throw up your hands before you really even get started. And that's where a lot of Christians get away from really living a Christian life. And you hear them say, and you probably have heard this, and maybe you've made the statement, I just can't live the Christian life. Well, join the club. None of us can. It's Christ living in and through us. And he gives us that grace and strength one second or moment at a time. Moment by moment, we have to have his strength. Here in the book of Philippians chapter 4, I want you to take and turn there with me if you would please. And I want us to look at the first five verses for the message tonight. He says, therefore, my, br- uh, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Now, uh, why does he twice in this one verse use the statement, dearly beloved? He's trying to get across to each one of us, as Christians, we belong to one another. And that's where the encouragement part comes in to help people not to have that yo-yo effect in their lives. That they can know that somebody's there as a mentor or someone's there to kind of help them when they stumble and so forth and so on. That is also called uh, a principle, Brother Ed, discipleship. Many of our churches, and maybe we don't do everything we should. I was talking to an individual today, and I said, here's what you need. I said, this and this, and I said, we call that discipleship. And they said, I like that. And I'm wanting to get them into this discipleship program. Everybody can take someone and kind of put them underneath their arm and uh, try to help them. And be uh, a mentor to them. Be one, uh, a, a discipler. And that's important. And uh, we all need that. So it's dearly beloved. And we got to get that focus that, hey, we're each called by the Savior's name. Jesus was called the beloved. So each one of us are dearly beloved. And that being the case, we don't want anyone to get off uh, and just be forgotten about. How many Christians tonight are not sitting here because they got into that yo-yo effect in their life and they just threw up their hands and quit and just, you know, said, what's the use? It's not worth it. But folks, when we think about the fact that Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And because of that, we don't need to get off track. Now what will happen, uh, and I I know I preached on that recently, uh, getting off track, but getting into that yo-yo effect is just as bad. And we got to be careful. And one of the reasons is this, because our effect upon other people's lives. When you and I get into that kind of mode, we affect everybody else around us. And the world needs to see a principle that's so let down in the Christian community today, and that's the word consistency. Would you say that with me? Consistency. 
You see, that hurts, uh, and we can use that in the, in the uh, social realm as well as in the spiritual realm. And uh, uh, we, we got to be careful. Be inconsistent. People can't put their trust in you if you're not consistent. I mean, they're not going to ask you to do certain things. If, for example, they, they ask you uh, to do something, you say, well, sure, I'll be glad to do that, and then you forget about it. You don't show up. And so you think they're going to ask you the next time? Most likely not, see. But how much more important it is as a Christian that you and I be consistent in our walk with the Lord and our testimony outwardly and the world really sees that Christianity, listen to me, that Christianity is real. Huh? And because of the lack of that outward show of realness, a lot of people have turned away from God. They don't want to hear about the gospel. Now, let's go on in the verses here. He says, I beseech Eodius and my beseech Synthetia that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Uh, what was happening? They become, became yo-yo Christians. They began to have conflicts with one another. And we'll show you that in a little bit more in a few minutes. Look at verse 3. I entreat thee, sit the next word with me, also, true, yellow, uh, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement and also with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known, say the next three words, unto all men. The word moderation there is very important because it means to be consistent, just stick with it, you know, just go on. You know, a lot of folks are like uh, uh, the horses and the mules that we had when I was a kid. We had a big white mare. And that white mare would get out there with a plow, and I mean, you couldn't hold on to the plow. I mean, Brother Ed, it just wanted to run almost with that plow. Pretty soon that mare was, you know, out of energy. Wanted to just sit down on you. Then we had a mule. That mule didn't take off fast, didn't go fast, but just took and plowed consistently. And by the way, plowed a straight furrow. A horse, a lot of times, will pl uh, pull and plow a straight furrow. And that mare and that mule were completely different. And I compare many Christians, they, they take off real quick. And they run like the 100-yard dash and they're out of wind. But I like somebody who runs the distance. God wants us to do that. He didn't want us to be up and down. He wants us to be consistent. So he says, let your moderation be known unto all men. Now here's the key. The Lord is at hand. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray you would take your word tonight, challenge us, that we would examine our lives to see if we're consistent. That we're not in that mode of being like a yo-yo up and down. We're up one minute and we're down the next. We're up and uh, we got things uh, uh, in control and the next minute uh, we're out of control or we're down, we're discouraged, we're despondent and we're ready to quit. And so, Father, I pray you would take your word tonight. It may it be a challenge to all those that hear. And, Lord, I pray that you would do us something in uh, each and every person here as well as my own life, that we would become always consistent in all that we do and say. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. How many of you have ever found yourself uh, begin something and then stop it? Come on, how many? You found uh, uh, something. Maybe it's uh, you've started, uh, like an example, you started memorizing scripture and then, you know, after a while, you just quit. Huh? How many of you said, boy, I'm going to read my Bible through this year and you find yourself getting into about judges and then you stop? Or especially if you get into numbers. Huh? I mean, you just want to pitch that book to the side sometimes, right? I mean, there are certain books you, you know, you really love to be in. Boy, I love being in the book of Psalms. How many of you love Psalms? We all love that book. I mean, we just keep reading. I mean, number one, most of those chapters are pretty short except for Psalm 119. 
And I mean, we can read those, some of those through just like that. Boy, man, I have my devotions today. Man, I'm, all, I'm up on top of this thing. But then we hit Psalm 119, we lay it aside. But if you think about Psalm 119, it's broken up into eight verses and sections. If you take one of those sections per day, it's easy. And so sometimes we're apt to give up. We're apt to stop, we're, uh, you know. And we start a lot of things and we get into that yo-yo effect. We're up and down. The other day I ran across this article. And it was entitled, How to Overcome Yo-Yo Dieting. I had to read that thing. How many of you ever been into the yo-yo dieting problem? You know, you started, man, you're, I mean, you're in, you're, you got that thing in control. And all of a sudden you said, man, I like that big piece of cake. I think I'll have another piece of cake. I'll have another piece of cake. That's about like at lunchtime, my wife brought a piece of cake over there. and I couldn't wait till uh, dessert time. I just went and ate it. Might as well get that thing over with, you know. <laughs> but we get into that. But uh, The article went on like this. Many people are familiar with the ups and downs of yo-yo dieting. The thrill of losing pounds, followed by discouragement and despondent and, and, and disappointment. All the things. Matter of fact, they, they found out most people who go on a diet, they lose... And they gain back more than what they had before. Why? They got into the yo-yo effect. And this article went on to say, uh, in regards to this, let's get rid of that yo-yo effect. Now, some of these things could almost be applied to what I'm sharing with you tonight. Uh, they said, go, go and get a place in your life of taking some ste steps to success. And uh, here's where some of the steps. Step number one, set small, reasonable, realistic goals. You know, a lot of Christians, when we uh, begin to set goals, we set too high. Now listen very carefully what I'm going to say. Like reading your Bible. You think that you have to sit down and read the whole Bible in one setting. That's setting too high of goal, see. Because number one, you're not going to be able to do that every day because, you know, work comes along or the kids, you know, need your attention, especially if you, if you have a baby or smaller children. And pretty soon you get away from that, see. And so the first thing they said about this matter of yo-yo dieting is set small, reasonable, realistic goals. I, I've, I've had um, uh, some Christians say to me, uh, uh, Preacher, what should I do now? I want to read my Bible. And one of the things I recommend people do is read the Bible the first part of the day. Why? Because the Word of God is your offensive as well as your defensive weapons to fight against the devil. If you wait till the evening, guess what happens? The devil's already defeated you all day long. And I said, well, preacher, I don't have time to read a chapter before I go to work or whatever. How about a verse? Huh? Grab onto a verse. Let your life begin that day with the Word of God and prayer and set realistic goals on how you can read that Bible and read it effectively and apply it to your life. There was a second thing. Exercise frequently and consistently. It's like this. Eating more meals in a day is better than eating great big meals, you know. Start off with that which you need at the beginning of the day and then taper off. My dad had the secret. My dad ate about six meals a day and did that for years. It's a better way to go. Your body functions better that way. So we can apply those same principles to the Christian life in regards to not getting into that yo-yo effect. Set small, reasonable, realistic goals. Exercise frequently and consistently in the same way with the Christian life. Read the Bible more often. You don't take and just, you know, do it. As a matter of fact, in memorizing Scripture, you and I, and I thought I had my cards in here. I must have put them back in my billfold. Uh, it's better to take that verse... And read it over several times a day rather than just sitting and trying to, you know, memorize that verse all at once. By the end of the week, you have that verse memorized. See? 
And that's the way it has been for years in memorization. When I was in, uh, at the university in, in this one particular Bible class, we had to memorize 20 verses a week. Now, how can you do that? You have them on cards, and you go over those frequently out through the day. You just keep looking at them. Keep reading them over and over and over and over and over again. By the end of the week, you've got them memorized. See? But it's doing that in the Christian life. Number, uh, step number three. Plan your diet around healthy foods. Now, that can be applied to the Christian life. Anything that's healthy spiritually, center your life around those things. If you and I surround our life with worldly things, what's going to happen? It's going to suck our time into that particular avenue. It's going to get us sidetracked from the things that we ought to be doing in the spiritual realm. You see, the devil is really shooting for our life. Listen, folks, the devil does not want you to become a mature, consistent Christian. Because if you do, you're going to affect somebody else's life. See? Then there was a fourth thing that that, that dieting plan, plan gave. Attend to the social and emotional aspects of weight loss. In other words, attend to the principles that it teaches and adhere to them. You see, the Bible says, and I've quoted these verses over and over again, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. What stops us, what gets us deterred from living a consistent Christian life is something that turns us away from God, whatever that thing might be. And so we need to become consistent in those areas. I read this statement and question from a resource. They asked, my question or more my request is this. Does anyone have any tips at staying downstream? I sometimes find it a struggle to keep myself on the right path. And as far as I understand, there should never be a struggle at all. Do I just accept that sometimes feeling bad is okay? Or should I avoid the bad thoughts all the time? Should I wait in confidence that it will happen? And the question I should ask, what if it doesn't work out? Maybe that happens to you. Now, the thought the person was trying to get across, you know, am I to stay in that situation if I do get into the yo-yo effect? Should I stay there? And the answer is no. Why? Because it's going to be detrimental to your Christian life. It's going to be detrimental to those that are around you. And your life is going to take and be non-effective for the Lord. So we need to understand that. Now, tonight, overcoming the yo-yo effect, I want you to keep the place at Philippians chapter 4, and I want you to turn back to the book of Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Look down at verse number 36, if you would, please. Here we find that Jesus had been going to city to city, teaching and preaching and healing people. But the Bible tells us something very important here in the Scripture. Look at verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Read it with me. Because they did what? Fainted. Now look up here. That is having the yo-yo effect. We begin to faint. We begin to have problems in our life. They, because they fainted and, here's the next problem, here's the, uh, here's the next part of the effect of the yo-yo, and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Now, there are three needs in that verse. The first one was, they fainted. All right? They fainted. Now, that being true, we need somebody around to help us, don't we? That means that we need someone to keep us in checkmate. We need someone else to answer to. So we don't get in that up and down situation that if we do feel down, we ought to be able to call somebody and say, please pray for me. Please help me. I, I'm feeling this way. Now, there's a second thing. They were scattered abroad. That's exactly what's happened to many Christians tonight. They're scattered. They've quit going to church. They've quit reading their Bibles. They've quit praying the way they should. They quit, listen, they quit having the effect of right living before other people. But there was a third thing that happened here in this verse. They had no 
shepherd. Now, folks, I want to say something very carefully tonight. When you take yourself out under the leadership of a spiritual leader, that's when you're going to get in trouble. My mind just went to some verses. And if I can find it real quick, if you'll bear with me. I believe it's found in the book of Hebrews. I want you to listen to this very carefully. Would you turn over to Hebrews chapter 13? There are two verses here that I want to get across to you. You need spiritual leadership. Now, I keep threatening you, and I'm going to do it one of these days. I'm going to give you that message from the book of Daniel on leadership. Why leadership? But look at verse 7, if you would, please. In Hebrews chapter 13, here we go. Remember them which have the rule over you, not dictated to them, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Now, jump down to verse number 17. Now, understand the words he's using here. The word rule and obey, it doesn't mean a dictator type of uh, 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 leadership. It says, obey them that have the rule over you. Why? Read it with me. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. You see, you need a spiritual shepherd. And many people have absent themselves from God's house. And how can the shepherd administer and help if they're not there? A shepherd, when uh, the sheep were having troubles, for example, they, let's say they got into a bar patch or so forth. Uh, with that wool, they just pull a lot of sticky stuff off into them, don't they? And sometimes that works its way down through the wool and literally wounds them. And the shepherd, he would see this and he would take and he would pull that out. And to help the person. He didn't want that sheep to be injured. Folks, that's exactly what your pastor tries to do. He tries to help keep those things pulled out of your life so you don't get injured. You don't, uh, you don't get discouraged. You don't get despondent. You, you don't get sidetracked from uh, 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 having the blessings of God in your life. But that will happen. Now turn back to the book of Philippians chapter 4, if you would, please. And let me very quickly give you some things tonight that I believe that can help you. You see, we Christians have our ups and downs, so the key to overcoming is to never lose heart or be disobedient to what God's Word has to say. So, look here, Philippians chapter 4, and I'm going to go right down the line, five verses here. He gives us five thoughts that will help our lives. Number one, look back at verse number one. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so, say the next two words with me, stand fast. The first thing that you and I are to do are, is to stand fast. Paul had something to say about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He talked about this matter being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor, say it with me, is not in vain in the Lord. You see, what we do, folks, is not empty. It's going to produce ultimately. But so often we get out of shape. We get out of, uh, what should I say, sorts with the Lord. And what happens to our lives? We begin to become weak in our steadfastness. And what happens to our lives, we begin to be backslidden. It's probably the best word I can say. We begin to grow cold towards the Lord. There's a verse I want to give you here very quickly. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. It says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you're being taught, whether by word or our epistle. 
You see, God wants us not to be a Christian that's blown about with every wind of doctrine, every new thing that comes down the road, everything that would detour us from uh, being happy, having the joy of the Lord, and being obedient to what God wants us to do. So Paul says here, we have to think about the fact of what things are going to be detrimental to our life and not be down and up and down and up and down and up. You know, uh, God wants us to be steadfast. We forget about the example that we have through Jesus Christ. Think about this tonight. What if Jesus would have come and said, and after all the uh, ridicule that he had from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you see, they, they, they were sad because of the fact that they didn't believe in the resurrection, did they? They ridiculed Jesus. I mean, people spat upon him. Said those things that probably that you and I would not want to hear that would turn our hearts away from God and just we'd want to throw up our hands and quit. But I'm glad that Jesus didn't quit, aren't you? I'm glad he had a course to follow. And he stood fast. He just kept with it. And I think tonight we all are in great struggle to stick to the t uh, stuff. As someone made the statement one time. Just stick with it. Don't get off into some other area of life that you think is more welcoming or more happier, if we may use that terminology. You see, as far as I can see what this Bible says, the devil is firing from every direction. And by the way, even more so because the Bible says that his time is short. And so he's going to be driving at your life. I mean, he's going to fire with every piece of arsenal that he has to try to get you to not stand fast. But the Bible tells us to stand fast here in the book of Philippians chapter 4. And he says, stand fast in the Lord. Now, here's the principle. It's not us who has the capability of standing fast. It's the Lord. Our responsibility is to allow him to keep us standing fast, see. We're answering it to him. You see, we would take and run from the fight. But when we realize our orders from the Lord, then we can stand fast. When we realize he's the one that gives us the strength, he's the one that gives us the ability to stand fast, then we can do it. We can't do it in our strength, see. And so the first thing Paul says, look, we're to have a responsibility to stand fast, and we have to realize that if there is a failure, it's not on God's part, it's on our part. Why? Because we have tried to stand in our own strength. You remember this? The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. See? The flesh is weak. The spirit is willing. And God is willing to give you that strength if you look to him. And we have to go back to Philippians here, chapter 4 and verse number 13. I can do all things through Christ, now watch this, which strengtheneth who? Me. Number 2. We must strive to be of one mind. Look at verse number 2. I beseech you, Iodius, and beseech, uh, beseech Synthetia, that they be of the same what? Mind. You see, if we're not on the same page, folks, it's going to be detrimental to our lives. If you're thinking one way to do something and uh, uh, another person thinking another way to do it, uh, that's contrary to what the Bible has to say, what happens? We're not being on the same mind. Well, this is what ha was happening here in the church of Philippi. These two individuals, they were in conflict with one another because this person wanted to do it their way, and this person wanted to do it their way rather than doing God's way. And what happened? They became at odds with one another. You see, God says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. See? And of course, as further you go down here in Philippians chapter 4, you find down in verse number 8 and 9, the Lord talks about this thinking that we ought to have. This one mind. What kind of mind is that? Look down at it real quickly if you would. Here's the type of mind God wants us to have. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are what? True. Now, look up here if you would, please. If you have one person over here and they're trying to do something that's not totally in functioning with what the Word of God has to say, it's not true. 
And so what we have is a divided mind. And one of the main principles the devil will do, he tries to get us through his scheme of divide and conquer. See? And that's where you have your divisions. They're not of one mind. And God says, look, this principle of unity and working together should always be the principle that we work, do things together on. You see, the Bible gives us many, many verses. And I didn't put all the verses down tonight. As a matter of fact, I didn't put any more down. But simply use the verse here in Philippians chapter 4, being of one mind. But the Bible abounds with this matter of unity, working together. Uh, yesterday, Doc and I were here trying to help with the things of the uh, funeral dinner and so forth. I hate, I hate lifting those heavy tables. I really do. And we're going to do something about that when I get back. We're going to get us some more light tables. We've got to. My back will kill me. I see. I had to go to docs, uh, you know, to get my back adjusted if I'm not careful. See, but when we were carrying those tables, it was so much easier with two of us carrying it rather than one. And folks, that's exactly what God wants us to do. The Bible says, "Bear ye one another's what." burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's all of us working together. It's all of us having one mind. It keeps us going in the right direction when we have one mind. You see, if we're going in the opposite directions, what we're doing is just pulling against one another. See? Something else. It keeps us from becoming self-centered. I want to do it my way. It's my way or the highway we hear, huh? No. It's working together. That's how we were able to pull off Vacation Bible School this past week. It's all of us. We realized we had a responsibility. So we had our different times that, uh, you know, we had some slip-ups, especially when a preacher gives the wrong schedule. But it all got straightened out. We were able to go on with the same line because we had a mind because those boys and girls need to be reached for Christ. And thank God we had boys and girls saved this week. And that's the whole goal of Vacation Bible School, is getting people saved and trying to reach into the homes and reach those families with the gospel of Christ. So not only keep us going in the right direction, it keeps us becoming self-centered. Second, thirdly, it keeps us having the mind of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that is to accomplish His plan and purpose that we might glorify His name in everything that we do in our life. Would you look at the third thing? Look at verse 3. We are to seek to help one another. Now, I know I briefly have said that, but look at verse 3. And I entreat thee also to yoke fellow. Help those women which labor with me in the gospel. Now, a while ago I gave you a story about my dad having a mare and having a mule. I'll tell you what. They don't work together, together too good. Why? Because they're different. When you become yoke fellows you're going to work together you're going to pull together you're going to rejoice together you're going to do the work of the Lord in a great and a fervent way why because there's more strength in two than there is one and by the way folks when you have two and one falls the other person can lift you up amen and we need that sometimes. We need that encouragement from somebody else. And so the Bible says we're here working together. It isn't just about me. It's not just about you. It's about him. See, didn't Jesus say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me? For I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. You see, that's the principle that, listen, that's the principle that you and I need to get a hold of that Jesus is going to help us. He's going to be right in there with us. We're yoked fellows. We're yoked together doing the job. Now, don't notice this in the second part of the verse. Help those women which labor with me in the gospel with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Here is the key, folks. Get a hold of this tonight. You and I, when we keep focus on the fact that we are all as born-again Christians in the book of life together, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We got something in common. 
And because we have something in common, we have the same goal. And that is, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all, say it with me, do it all to the glory of God, see. And Paul said, listen, if we're going to stay out of that yo-yo effect, we must come to seek to help one another. And there's so much that we can say about that in the Bible. But look at verse 4. There's a fourth thing God tells us that will help us to stay out of that yo-yo effect. And that is, keep a rejoicing spirit. Look at it, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord how long, folks? Always. When you notice yourself not rejoicing, you've gotten into that yo-yo effect. Because God says we can rejoice. You see, we may not like a circumstance that we might be in, but remember this. He's in there with us. Do you ever think about this? The Lord didn't, uh, Lord didn't deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fiery furnace. He got in there with them. Hmm? Think about this. God didn't see fit to deliver Daniel out of the lion den's den. He was in there with him. And if God be for us, say it with me, who can be against us? See, that means you and I can rejoice in the Lord always. Now, we may not be able to rejoice in the circumstance, but there's victory in the circumstance, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and just like Daniel, in the midst of being in those trials and problems, we can rejoice. Why? Because the Lord's are with us. And we need to see that. So you and I need to realize we're to have a rejoicing spirit. What happens to us? Would you listen very carefully? If we don't stay in a rejoicing spirit, what usually takes place in our lives? Number one, we get a complaining spirit. Hello, can I hear an amen? amen. Yeah. Not only do we get a complaining spirit, we get a critical spirit. We begin to criticize instead of encouraging. And so we've got to be careful about that. And then here's another thing that happens. We begin to get a murmuring spirit. So all type three of those things can be detrimental to our lives and puts us in that yo-yo effect. Watch yourself the next time. You begin to get a murmuring spirit or a critical spirit. You'll begin to see how it will affect your life. And it'll begin to affect other, somebody else's life. Have you ever noticed this? You get around some people and you begin to criticize this and this and that. Everybody else starts criticizing too. See? So Paul says, wait a minute. What kind of spirit should we have? A rejoicing spirit will keep us out of that yo-yo effect in our lives. But wait a minute. There's two more things very quickly. The next thing is realize weariness will come in your life. Weariness will come in your life. Keep your place in Philippians there. And turn back to chapter 6, if you would, of Galatians. Just a few books back. And look down at verse number 9, if you would, please. Realize tonight, when you and I become weary, we're to be careful because we will get ourselves into that yo-yo effect. But we need to look what the Bible says. Now, here's the principle to apply. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us... Not be what? Weary. Now stop right there and that will become detrimental to your life. But if you begin to read the rest of the verse, there are two principles involved in this matter of not becoming weary. What are they? We'll look back at the verse. And let us not be weary in, say the next two words with me. Well doing. You see, sure we may become weary of the work, in the work, excuse me, but let's never become weary of the work. Huh? There's a difference there. I mean, it's easy because of physical strain, uh, opposition, or whatever it might be in your life, that weariness will come into your life. But don't ever get weary of the work, see? That'll help you to keep on keeping on when you do not become weary of the work. And I know how a lot of times we can get into God's work, and it can be overbearing sometimes, couldn't it? I mean, sometimes we want to throw up our hands and say, well, you know, I, I, I just can't do this any longer. Be careful. Be careful. 
Now I realize there are times that you, you have to step, step aside. I realize that. There are times when we just feel like, you know, okay, maybe somebody really can do this better. And, and you can most of the time find out, you know, when you, you need to step aside. But sometimes the devil gets people to quit or should say, kind of retire too soon. See? We've got to be careful about it. Why? Because we become weary. Yes, we'll get weary in the work, but don't become weary of the work. We must realize it's the principle of well-doing. But wait a minute, there's a second thing. We must realize that in the proper time we will reap. We will be rewarded for those things that we do. Look, look back at the verse. It says, and let's not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall what? Reap if what? We faint not. In other words, if we don't give up, we don't get into that yo-yo effect in our life and say, well, you know, somebody else can do it better than I can. Listen, if God wants you to do it, he'll give you that which is needed for your life. See, don't quit too soon. Don't stop too soon because the golden nuggets are just below your feet. And so many Christians give up and say, well, I'm just, you know, and, and I'm not saying this because some of you have maybe have come to the place you can't do some things anymore because of your age or maybe because of a physical problem. That's understandable. But don't give up. My heart was thrilled, LaRue, when you took that class. I mean, it was time to get back in, wasn't it? It was time to get back in and start rowing that boat. huh? You see, God can use you. I've told you about Mrs. Turner. She lives in Florida. And uh, she was in our church there at uh, Calvary Baptist Temple down in Cincinnati. And uh, was there for quite a bit of time. I was there for not, almost nine years. And uh, she was one of our members. And, and uh, finally that uh, her husband passed away and she moved to Florida. And uh, at 80, that was at that particular time, that was a couple of years ago. She's about 87 now. I haven't talked with her lately, but she was in the Iwana program. It's a children's program, just like our Olympian program. And she was still working in Olympians at 85 years of age. Now, folks, that's not becoming weary, but well-doing. And she's not going to faint because she knows God's with her. God's given her the strength to do it. You see, it's just making up your mind by God's grace. I'm going to stick with it. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to faint. I'm just going to do what God wants me to do. Then look at the last thing. Verse number 5, back in Philippians chapter 4. Look at the verse. It says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, listen very carefully, and I close with this. Time after time, I must admit as a pastor, I've wanted to give up. I've just wanted to quit. But then the second coming of Christ comes back in my mind. And I think about Jesus coming and how many people need still to need to get saved. I think about loved ones. I think about friends. I think about our neighbors around here. I think of all the people around here in New London and, and, and around about our area here. And how many people are not ready to die. They're not ready to meet the Lord. They're not ready. The Lord, what's it say there? Look at verse 5. The Lord is at hand. You know what that means? Imminence. That means it can happen any time. And how much that ought to shove us for? And it does me. When I think of it, it motivates me to get out here and knock on doors. It motivates me to do uh, what God would have me to do in, a, in, the, in the ministry that he's given us. That's the motivation. And I can't quit but thinking about, you know, uh, uh, people dying. Uh, Doc, as I was standing there yesterday uh, at the funeral service, or I call it a memorial service for a Christian, and I was standing there and I saw all those people that were sitting there and how I really wanted to see those who were not saved. And of course, I don't know who's not saved and who is saved, but I'm sure there was some there. And I thought about, if some of these folks die today, some of them are not going to go to heaven. And I thought about the fact of the coming again of Christ, that we could stand right there and Mag Hall would come forth just like that. Why? Because Jesus said the dead in Christ will rise, what? First. You see, the return of Christ ought to motivate every one of us to reach our loved ones, our neighbors, our friends with the gospel of Christ before it's eternally too late. And Paul had that in mind. He says, look, we've got to do it. We've got a job to do. And folks, I want to say this to you tonight. First Baptist Church has a job to do. 
And I thank God for every one of you that are trying to do something for the Lord. But maybe some of you are not involved. And you need to get involved. You say, Lord, what would you have me to do? I know I said I was going to close, but let me give you this. And I don't want to embarrass this person at all. But both Sandy came to me this morning and said, Preacher, I want to get involved. The Lord's speaking to my heart. I want to do something for the Lord. And so I says, all right, Sandy. I says, would you come back tonight? And uh, I, always put them, I always put them off a little bit because I really want to see if they mean business. I didn't want you, you know, but I want to see if they mean business. And um, so he met with me tonight. And we went over some areas in regards to what God, maybe God would have him to do. Why? He wants to serve the Lord. And God has no limits on who he can use. I've told you about uh, 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 Brother Bernie, and you heard me, when I was uh, in the bus ministry in New Jersey. And Bernie, big old burly guy. I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't talk very well. You know, he stuttered. And I've told you that before. But Bernie, I says, oh, okay, Bernie. I says, uh, you come next Saturday morning for our bus uh, meeting. And we always had a breakfast first. And then we'd go out visiting. I said, you come and uh, uh, I'll take you out on the bus route. And I'll teach you what we do on the bus route and see if you really want to go. And I said to myself, he won't be there. Next Saturday, I got there and he was there before I got there. Bernie became a very successful bus pastor. Why? Because that's what God wanted him to do. Bill Selfhauser. Bill Selfhauser. One Sunday morning I asked for uh, people to work in the bus ministry. After the service, this guy came up to me. I mean, he had a long beard, long hair. I mean, just the whole works, you know. And he says, uh, I said, what can I do for you? He says, I'm going to get involved in the bus ministry. Yeah, right. I says, okay. I said, uh, next Saturday you meet me back over here at the bus, uh, at, the, uh, at our gymnasium where we had our breakfast and so forth. And uh, he came and Bill had his uh, beard shaved off. He went on the bus route. Some kid called him a hippie and so the next day he came in with his hair cut. God wants to use you. God wants to use me. And he wants us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not, say it with me, in vain in the Lord. Folks, we got a job to do. Let's stick with it. Let's not become, let the yo-yo affect our lives. But let's just stick with it and do the job that God has given us here at First Baptist Church. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Jesus is coming again.